you've got to start with the basics. You don't um, you don't replace brainwashing with more brainwashing. It doesn't work. It takes away from this time that you have to connect with the kids and to build something consistent. We can undo the stuff with uh, old earth creationism later, but to do it right now when we've only got four or five days with them, that's not enough time. And it's the wrong focus. We need to focus on helping them to understand these simple messages of the gospel because a lot of these kids have never heard it before. You tell a kid about Santa Claus and you play it up and you give evidences for it and then eventually they go off somewhere else or they hear from somebody else, hey, Santa's not real. And then all of a sudden, wow, you got a big old handful of resentment on your hands. And it, like, I I mean, I agree. I would like to see uh, more kids and more families hold a young earth creationist perspective, but there's a way you go about it in a way that doesn't create that tension. Hey everyone, this is What's Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I'm talking with Steve, who is a young earth creationist, but doesn't like Answers in Genesis VBS curriculum. Tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, how are you doing today, and uh, what's your background in all this? Well, I'm doing pretty good right now. My my dog over here, we've got a greyhound pup. He's, he's kind of losing his brain right now. Mom is away from home and he gets kind of antsy. Um, but other than that, doing pretty good right now. Uh, so my background, basically, um, I graduated as... Uh, from Truett McConnell University with a biblical studies degree. And I've always been interested in the area of young earth creation science. I'm familiar with answers in Genesis, and I used to be a Ken, a Ken Hamite, where I would live and breathe practically everything that the, the man said. Uh, got to college and kind of moved away from answers in Genesis since then. Um, so currently, right now, I'm a youth pastor at a small church in Georgia. And we were doing um, their VBS curriculum for this year. This is my first year there, and uh, I'd never heard that they were doing a VBS curriculum or anything like that. I was like, hmm, well, this will be interesting. Let's see how this goes. Uh, so the reason why I ended up doing the Bible study is because our Bible study leader had to end up dropping out pretty close to last minute, about a month out. And so our VBS director asked me if I'd be willing to fill in. I said, sure, yeah, I'd be willing to fill in. So she gave me the curriculum and said, I know it's bad. Do whatever you can with it. Use as little or much as you want. And so I was like, all right, that's kind of odd. But OK, um, very well. I open it up. I start reading. And right away I'm going, oh, good Lord. There's no way we're running this the way it's written. I flipped through every day of it and I was like, this is the most awkward and poorly written dogmatic piece of garbage I've ever seen in my life. So what I ended up doing is I just ended up saving a couple of the main themes, a few of the verses that went with it. I scrapped everything else and started over. <sighs> Which is very frustrating because I as we'll discuss a little bit later, I agree with young earth creationism. I am a young earth creationist. I believe that uh, the Bible's uh, points in the direction of young earth creationism. I There are some scientific facts that I can't get away from that I think point to young earth creationism. And all of that, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, how did you guys make such a terrible and almost unusable curriculum? And it frustrated me because it's like, these are some of the most popular voices in the Christian movement, and yet they made something that's so clunky and so so focused on the evolution bashing that it won't be very effective. And that's that's my frustration and what brought me over to your channel. That's very fascinating. So for those watching, uh, me and Stephen haven't talked about it that much. Uh, so a lot of this will be new, and I'm very interested to see what he's going to say about this. Um, <clears throat> Just, just for those watching, um, yeah. So I, I mean, this is, this is a almost like a fun little topic. Um, but for me personally, this is something I care about just because, uh, you know, I, I want, I, I hate the idea of people growing up in, you know, a, a Christian home, and then as soon as they go to college, it's, oh, you know, you have to trust the science and get rid of Christianity and all that. So like that's that's the main reason I'm doing this. And I, what I want to do here is I want to analyze this and see like where we can correct it, where they do well and um, just where we can go here from here. And um, this will also be a fun conversation because uh, we get, you know, me and Steven, 
don't agree on everything. So it'll be fun to flesh those things out and, you know, have a good Christian conversation about it. Um, so with that being said, uh, you have a bit of a background with Todd Wood and some other people um, that are uh, popular in the young earth creationism community. Can you talk to, just briefly about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, going to Truett McConnell University, uh, I already knew that there was a focus on young earth creationism, and I found out why pretty quickly. It's because there were two fairly prominent young earth creationists that work there. Uh, one of them, Dr. Kurt Wise, who is probably the one of the greatest minds in the young earth creationism world. He's going to hate that I'm saying that, but get over it, Kurt. Um, uh, the man is just he, he's a wealth of knowledge, both in the realm of evolutionary biology and in the young earth creation scientists. And being a uh, uh, what's that word, a paleontologist himself and, you know, being able to understand the way that these fossils work and whatnot. Uh, just talking to them is just an adventure. It's like going on a safari. Um, you're getting to learn all of these new things with a tour guide who's just walking you through all of it. And he's this little wiry guy that's just like so excited about every little thing that happens around him. Uh, and then there was also uh, Tom Hennigan, who was a mentor of mine at the school. Um, while not a doctorate, he is very well versed um, in both the realm of evolutionary biology and in the creation sciences. Uh, he worked more in like animal preservation. Uh, he like he got to work with uh, with a wolf preserve, some Arctic foxes, um, and in his time before he came to Christ, uh, he he was just as much of an environmentalist as anybody else. Um, and after uh, he found Christ and his life started to change, he got into the realm of young Earth creation sciences and he fell in love with it. And then he started to connect those dots himself. And he's like, oh, this makes sense to me. And so he was a big source of information for me. My wife used to work with uh, Dr. Todd Wood, who's another one of the big minds in the creation sciences. And he focuses a lot on um, the uh, VBS curriculum. It, this, this thing's really weird. There's a section where it talks about uh, the missing links and the missing fossils and whatnot. Um, which is really weird to put in a VBS curriculum, but I guess it works for a transition on the conversation. Um, he focuses a lot on those transitional forms and uh, and on the skulls. Like he's got all these like little decorative like skull facsimiles. One of the uh, people that provides for him even knitted a little uh, hat to put on top of the little skull. It's adorable. He puts it on every uh, every Christmas and he sends a picture out to all of the people who... Uh, who support them. Um, and then through them, we're also connected to Marcus Ross, who's over at Liberty university and a couple others. And as my wife was wrapping up her time working with Dr. Wood, she also got to connect a lot more with, uh, one of the British ones, uh, one of the British creation scientists, uh, Paul Garner. And it's like, we've got all these connections all over the place. And so we, we get a pretty, real feel for what's going on in the science world of the creation sciences. And it, it just kind of like gives us a new light into that. Um, yeah, words are hard, but continue. <laughs> yeah, no, that's super cool. It's, it's, it's uh, very fascinating to hear about someone with that kind of background. And uh, um, I mean, that's some big names right there. So that's, uh, that's pretty got to be a pretty cool thing to do. Um, They're all really so anyway weird, by the way, and they know it. <laughs> They know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so anyways, I wanted to get your general views on like how you could, what you thought about evolution and all that. So, um, so I'll ask you a question then I'll, and I'll clarify just to be clear. So um, what I was curious about is what do you think as far as how much evidence is there for evolution? And when I mean evidence, I mean anything that raises the probability of a proposition. So for example, um, it could be something like a, a flat earth. So um, I would say that there is evidence for a flat earth. You know, it's you look outside and it doesn't look like there's a globe or anything like that. Um, but we do know from, you know, our scientific method and like our way of analyzing the world that we have good reason to think that there is a globe and that is more evidence in favor of the global idea than a flat earth uh, a lot more evidence of that too so with that being said would you say like there is just no evidence for evolution a little bit or how would you clarify that before i get to that for any flat earthers mm -hmm. who are listening cone sun 
You, your diagram shows a ball of light and it only shines down in a cone. Cone sun doesn't work. <laughs> but to get back to uh, your actual question, um, I would say there's evidence in a loose description. Here's And here's kind of what I mean by that. Um, within that worldview and within that way of thinking, then yes, you could look around and you could see things that support your position. And before I go on, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I, there, I, there are things that interest me and things I can latch onto, but I can't get into the deeper stuff because it's not the way my mind works and it's not the things I've studied. But from what I've seen and from the things that I've been taught and the things that I've observed myself, it seems like within that, uh, within that set worldview, the world would look like uh, it comes from an old earth uh, evolutionary transitional form perspective. My problem is there's usually another way to look at the evidence that gives a different conclusion. So like um, before we got started, I was I was uh, telling you about how uh, there's like those those little things, those little nuggets of things, like whenever you find something that's exciting to you, even if it's not something like substantial, it's like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to remember that until the very day I die. And even if I start to lose my mind to dementia, I'm still going to remember that. And I'm still going to talk about that till my dying breath. Uh, there were two things that have really in the scientific world uh, confirmed to me that there's an issue with the way that we approach the sciences. The first one, it's not really that much of a uh, that much of an evidence or anything, but it was the thing that started that rolling for me when it comes to the evidences is the fossilized hat. There's a it was after I forget which volcanic eruption it was, but uh, it immediately created this fossilized hat. Now, of course, there are different forms of fossilization, so. Um, you, I mean, you could easily argue away. That's not really an evidence. Yeah, I know it's not. But what it did is it made me realize, oh, I can't fit everything into my perfect little box. And sometimes things that we think take a long time can also happen in a really short period of time. The next thing that happened was an actual, what I would say, concrete evidence uh, was learning about radio halos from Dr. Wise. Every year he does a... Uh, one of the chapel sections where he gives his perspective and he shares some of his research and his studies when it comes to young earth creation sciences. And there are these little things called radio halos that are found in rocks. And it's like little bits of radioactivity that happen. They spread out and it's supposed to happen over millions of years. And while that started off as an evidence for an old earth, what we also discovered is those can be destroyed and recreated in a catastrophic event, potentially catastrophic plate tectonics where the uh, plates of the mantle of the earth can tip up and dip back into the ocean. That's something that uh, no paleontologist or um, geologist will deny is a possibility and probably has happened throughout history. But also those catastrophic plate tectonics that can create and destroy those radio halos could be an example of how a global flood could have come around. And that was another thing that opened my eyes to me. It's like, dude, so something that could have taken millions of years can be created and destroyed instantly. And that's stuck in my head as well. And I would say that that's a science evidence in terms of the biblical stuff. My big thing with the biblical stuff is I don't see the evidences for the other side. I've heard their arguments. I've I've followed them through and through. One of the things I love to do is, I don't want to call it opposition research, but I love to study the works of people that disagree with me. And so like I study uh, theologians that come from an old earth uh, position. And my problem is, is when I look at their arguments, I find that they're not really quite satisfactory. Um, and I'm, I'm trying not to get on too long of a tangent so that we can actually talk about the thing that we came here to talk about. Um, but for for me, it's like when I'm on TikTok right now, I'm kind of doing this thing where I'm correcting some of the myths about the Bible being uh, pro-choice. And it's usually it's really, really bad theology and a really horrible misuse. I saw one guy, he uh, uh, I think it was the Sebastian Cole. He used a prophecy about Jesus to say that you could abort your kids even after they were alive. And I'm like, what the, where's, where's, where'd you get that from? 
for me, that's how it is with uh, the Bible and uh, old earth creationism. I don't see how it fits together. I've heard the arguments and I'm sympathetic towards the arguments and it's not going to be something I'll beat you over the head over, but I can't make that connection because I just don't see the dots connecting in the passages. So I would say those are the two areas where I do see evidences for young earth creationism, but I do understand uh, where people get the idea for old earth evolution, transitional forms. I understand where that comes from. Well, we agree with one thing. We agree that the Bible doesn't teach an old earth. So that's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So yeah, uh, to continue. Um, so basically you would say that um, as far as why, you know, the most scientists are big fans of evolution is because it seems to work on some level, but you would say that there's there's some things that uh, that make you think that, oh, it might not actually be that way. There might be a better way to look at it. And, you know, it seems like each view might have some, not like chinks in their armor, but like um, issues. And you'd say that like Young Earth creationism does a better job of analyzing the day. Is that like a good way to put it? or I think it's an okay way to put it. And the main way I'd say that it's okay is because I wouldn't give that much credence to all young earth creationists. Uh, cause there's, there's some pretty wild ones out there. I will not, I will not deny so, There are some out there that believe completely off the wall stuff. Um, canopy theory was one that came up. I believe it came out of young earth creationism. We don't believe that anymore. Um, but there's still some who will dogmatically hold to it. Uh, there are some gap theorists that, uh, sprouted from the young earth creationism movement and that doesn't work and line up either and it's just i i wouldn't say that as a category the young earth creationists are better at it it's just i found a select few that seem to put more effort into it wow that is not the response i expected but a very interesting one to that um and would how much would you say like the biblical data as far as like if if you if if you found out the Bible wasn't true, would you still be a young earther? I would be conflicted. Okay. And the reason I would be conflicted is because, yeah, I mean, there there's no need to deny it. The Bible is a huge reason to be a young earth creationist. I mean, there's I don't think there's a reason to be a young earth creationist outside of the Bible. Um, but I would have some difficulty with some of the science stuff, some of the things that I shared with you as well, but also with some of the cultural stuff. And I've I've showed I showed you before we started uh, one of the resources that I kind of read, but there's another one that I've been reading as well called uh, Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer. He is a he is a secular um, science historian, and this book is him documenting uh, what happened with Darwin and his research right after he published it, and a lot of the criticisms that came out from it that we don't hear about anymore. There's there was like this brainwashing effect that was taking place shortly after Darwin stuff came out where it was like mass accepted. And then all of this criticism for Darwin and his theory was shoved under the rug. And so what he does in this one is he outlines, Hey, there's actually some support, not only that Darwin's theory might be incorrect, but it looks like from what we've seen in history, there might be support for an intelligent design. And I would just find all of, I would find all of these other issues that would just, they would eat away at me. I'm like, well, if the Bible's not true, but then at the same time, I've got all of this over here that I've got to deal with now, and I don't have the Bible to fall back. That it would be this big conflicting response within me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, specifically on the topic of the VBS curriculum. So, as you know, with my background and you know, kind of teaching in churches and leading small groups stuff like that, you know, there's obviously you know, anytime there's a disagreement about theological beliefs, like you're going to get some type of drama usually. Um, but it seems like you're, uh, the person that gave you the curriculum was like, Hey, you can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. Um, yeah. but at the same time, you probably were a little conflicted too, because I'm sure there are a whole bunch of other young earth creationists there that are big fans of answers in Genesis. So, um, could you talk about like, if there was any conflict there as far as like, Oh, do I just like throw out the curriculum or do I use some parts or how does that work? So as far as I know, there was no conflict. Um, and part of that's because there weren't a lot of people in there. Um, like we, 
we did rotating groups where a couple of adults would take a couple of kids and they'd rotate through. And so I probably only saw about one fourth of the volunteers that were helping out. And it's not like we were publishing, like, this is what we're talking about on this day. So uh, if there was someone who would be upset about it, I doubt they probably heard about the changes I made. Um, but for the adults that were there, they responded very positively to what I had reworked. And so I'm honestly, I'm in a really good environment right now. I've earned trust with these people. Um, I've earned respect from them and, uh, they know that they can come and ask me if there's something wrong. So as far as I'm aware, there was no, uh, conflict in changing the curriculum. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, it sounds like you're having a good, good environment as far as like being open and, you know, being will, being willing to dialogue and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. So what would you say is a good summary of um, the curriculum as far as like themes they introduced and talked about and as well as um, your your basic issues with it? OK, so the overarching message that they were trying to get across, and I think it's their tagline for this year, was uh, returning to the value of life. And so at first it sounds like Okay, so this is probably going to be like a, a pro-life message. And I open it up and that's there, but it's much more heavy handed on the uh, evolution bashing, which is for every one of the uh, scientists that I've mentioned, they hate the evolution bashing because it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't convince people. It just makes people mad. Um, and on top of that, the big issue that I have is uh, this curriculum day by day was trying to undo everything these kids have learned in school or from their parents or from other churches. They were trying to undo all of that and replace it in one week. Kids are not ready for a conflict of belief. They're not prepared for that yet. Their brains haven't developed that way yet. So you've got to start with the basics. You don't um, you don't replace brainwashing with more brainwashing. It doesn't work. You have to start with building a foundation of trust. This curriculum didn't do that. And it made me very irritated. So like in terms of like the individual themes for the first day, it was, uh, we are made in God's image with the tagline. They won't make a monkey out of me all focused on just trying to undo, uh, the lies of evolution and these horrible evils. Don't let them convince you. There is one point where I think it actually did say, don't let them convince you that you're a monkey. Uh, for the second day, uh, it was the idea of being intricately made that God created our bodies in a specific, uh, way. And it did this weird anatomy lesson thing. Uh, for day three, it did all life is valuable, which this was the big pro-life day that they tried to hit. Um, and it was also big on, being anti-euthanasia, which was also kind of weird. The fourth day salvation was, is an okay salvation presentation. And then back to uh, day five is you've got purpose and more evolution bashing. It's just all along the way, it was this, it was putting down people who believe in evolution. It was, it was not written for kids. Uh, it was written entirely, it seems, for people who already believe in young earth creationism um, or to try to brainwash them from this old earth evolutionary thinking into young earth creationism. That's what really irritated me and convinced me that I've got to redo this entire thing. There is no way that I can let this stand because it's just going to push people away and leave the kids confused. And we've only got one week with them. So we're going to hit the gospel hard. And so that's how I, I redid the entire thing to just build this consecutive gospel presentation where every day had a gospel presentation of some sort. Uh, I kept a couple of the major themes, modified them. So like we only did four days. So what I did for the first day uh, was I told them that um, God made us humans to be special. We're the only things made in his image. Okay. That's something that we can agree on whether we're old earth or young earth. Humans are made in God's image. We can all agree on that. So let's stick with that right now. And then day two, uh, what did I do for day two? I had it pulled up. Uh, for day two, I said that we've got everything that we need, like how God gave us like lips 
and uh, fingers and everything that we need in order to live and survive, God also gave us everything that we need in order to know who he is. And that's when you point them back to the Bible and we do a short little gospel thing. Day three was a hardcore gospel presentation of how Jesus made a way. Um, because he made us in his image, he loves us, and he's given us everything he, that we need in order to know him. Now we get to what Jesus is doing to bring us back to him. And then for day four, close it out with a simple thing. If we're special in God's eyes, we're made in his image, and he loves us and wants us to be with him, then we can get out there and we can show that love to somebody else. It ended up working out really well and being very consistent, which was a big change from what we were doing uh, beforehand in the rest of the curriculum. I'd say that's a, a, a basic um, a basic overview of how the curriculum went and what I did in order to fix it. Okay, so it sounds like you or the this curriculum was wasn't with just like these three year old kids. I would assume that's correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, I mean, we had everything from three year olds up to. Uh, I think that we even brought a seventh grader in because he came with a family member. And so he just traveled around with the group. Um, okay. So, and it's like, you got to be able to write something that can convey a simple message to a wide age range. And this just didn't, it, it just did not do that. It was like trying to communicate with like adults, but using very, very, very childish tactics. It was just very awkward. Well, that's that's going to obviously pique my interest. Like, what what do you mean by childish tactics? So I think I think I might have sent you a, a page that has this with it, but they have a puppet section that they threw in there. If you want to, you know, pull out a puppet and do the actions and show us how you, how how it's supposed to be done, then that that could be fun too. I just sip it because I don't have a puppet, but <laughs> um, so they have this this really childish puppet part where they're, you know, they just get done talking about all of this, like bigger stuff that adults would be able to understand teenagers, maybe kids, not so much. And then they transition from that into this weird, very childish puppet act. And I've, I've got it open in the book right here and I'll just kind of like read how some of this goes. So it's a conversation between the teacher and the puppet. So this puppet, Sydney. Sydney's kind of ugly right now. All right, so uh, puppet's supposed to pop up and say, "Did you say the uh, first person's name was Adam?" And say, "Oh, good day there, Sydney." You can tell how this is already going to go. And the puppet goes, "Was Adam smart? He was very smart. Could he?" talk of course he could talk he even had an important job of naming all the animals did he come from an ape-like creature you see where this is going right this is this is it, it's it's the most child i've worked with kids like i had three years experience of uh working with Centra kid camps and uh, like I, I worked with kids because i loved it i i, I did this because I connect well with kids. I can get them excited. I, I can understand like why they're not understanding like what the what the lesson is and like, okay, how can I redirect this in a way that you guys would understand? I'm looking at this and I'm like, we have like four or six graders. They are going to roll their eyes and hate every moment of this. My third graders are going to roll their eyes and hate this. I've got a few fourth graders that I know are going to try to reach up and grab hold of this puppet. And so what I, as I was reading through it, my, my issue was, is like, it felt like it was written by somebody who has never had experience with kids. And it's, it was irritating to me. It's like, you guys should know if you're writing a kid's curriculum, how to interact with kids. It feels like this wasn't play tested at all. Um, Whenever I see a kid that's excited about uh, like a mannequin or like a, a puppet act, it's always something that's a little bit humorous. There, there's never a single moment where there's even an attempted joke. Uh, the puppet doesn't interact with the audience at all. It only interacts with the teacher the whole time. This, it's just, it's just, it's a dull two D experience. You're losing the kids' interests. What are you doing? 
Uh, so that's why I ended up rewriting things and putting in a bunch of games that were much more interactive and completely cut out the puppet altogether. I don't, I don't know why they put that in there, but, you know, to each their own, I guess. That's fascinating. So it's nothing to do with theology, nothing to do with, you know, scientific beliefs. Purely has to do with just the, the puppet. <laughs> well, it's... The, the age range, it should be. The, yeah, because like the, the the puppet thing could have worked with like the the three year olds or the four year olds, but like putting it in with like the rest of the age group was just very awkward and it just wasn't going to work. And it's not great for a church that has like uh, no budget in order to run the stuff off of. I don't think we've ever seen a puppet in the past 40 years. Yeah, well, it's interesting. The. I mean, the scientific portion, there's this big portion about missing links. And it, it even mentions uh, it mentions older primaries can handle more than younger ones. But make sure to keep it moving. As in, like, don't get too scientific for the younger kids. So, like, right. they, they acknowledge that there's an age range here. But it's, it is a huge jump to go from, yeah, Lucy was wrong for this reason and named the 17 different things compared to doing little puppets. <laughs> yes. And here's the thing with this is you're, you're coming into one of two categories. You're either coming in with these kids having years and years of uh, having, having this belief system about uh, how humans evolved, or this is their first experience with it. And so then what you're having, what you're doing is you're kind of sending these two messages. You're, you're, you're like sending this message of, I'm going to undo everything you believe. And also I'm going to create everything you believe. And I have difficulty with it because it's like, I, I did some research on each of these cases and like what they say about these transitional forms is true. Like, uh, like Piltdown Man was a fraud. Nebraska Man was a pig. Like they're like these things that they are they're talking about here. Like they actually did happen. Do you really need to undo all of that? It, and it's an approach that they take with uh, their seven C's of uh, of salvation. It's how they present the gospel. It, like starts with creation, then it goes to corruption. You've got cross in there, consummation, which is a really weird word to teach kids. Um, but you've got this is their entire approach is they present the gospel by undoing evolution, rebuilding with young earth creationism, and then presenting the gospel. There's no reason to do that at VBS. It's a, it, 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 it takes away from this time that you have to connect with the kids and to build something consistent. We can undo the stuff with uh, old earth creationism later, but to do it right now when we've only got four or five days with them, that's not enough time. And it's the wrong focus. We need to focus on helping them to understand these simple messages of the gospel because a lot of these kids have never heard it before. And that's, that's yeah, that's, that's why I get upset with that section, even though science-wise, I don't see something wrong with it. It, just, it takes the wrong approach. Hmm. Okay, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I, had, I do have some thoughts, um, although I, I, from a channel perspective, I don't really care that yep. much about the science, as we talked about. But um, so so my first thought is that, you know, Enters in Genesis is really big on, like, you have to under, you have to believe in a literal Adam and Eve and a younger Earth if you want to say that, you know, Christianity is true. Because, you know... You, you get rid of the sin problem, that kind of thing, and the gospel falls apart, that kind of thing. Um, so you would you agree that even if Genesis, well, do you agree with that principle that, that it's so important to the gospel like that? I think that it's the best way to stay consistent because it does it does cause problems if you take it to be, and this, this is kind of coming from the more nerdy uh, Hebrew side because I took Hebrew during uh, during college and I've been studying it on my own since then. Um, my issue is, is there's an inconsistency with how a lot of the older theologians approach the Genesis account because they take it from like this, uh, this perspective of the first couple of chapters or even the first 11 chapters being this more poetic literature. But my problem is, is like, I don't see that in the words or in the layout. There's different verb forms that are used for poetry and sure. the verb forms that are used throughout most of this is narrative historical um there 
it, it's a verb form that moves narration forward and it's very 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 rarely used in poetry not only that but you compare those first few chapters of genesis to the language that's used in like joshua or judges or the samuels or the kings and it's it's the same structure so why are we taking one of these to be uh poetry but not the other one and that's i think that creates an inconsistency that needs to be addressed now i'm not going to say that you're not a christian if you're an old earth creationist um I'm not going to say that you're a, a heretic either, but I do think it does cause problems that will need to be addressed eventually. Yeah, so my personal position on that would be that uh, I see somewhat good reasons to say that there are some poetic elements throughout Genesis 1-11, but it's definitely, I think you can pretty confidently say that at least 2-11 is narrative, and then there's debate among scholarship whether Genesis 1 is like a, a mix of prose and poetry and all that. But really for me, it doesn't even matter because you can have poetry that's historical. So yes, it, yes, it, that's a very, it, that's a very healthy perspective. Yeah. It, it's kind of a silly debate for me. And especially the older, um, especially the older creationist people like, like, Oh, it's poetry. So we can throw it out. Like, come on, that's, that's not how that works. Um, yeah. yeah. But anyways, uh, yeah. So that makes sense. But so, so, but but as we both know, that answers in Genesis is really big on you have to believe it's historical or Christianity is false. So it seems like um, that is why it's so important for them to talk about that in such a VBS format. Does that make sense? Because yes, I mean obviously that's their goal as an organization. That's why they're popular. But um, you know, like I get, I think I think you get what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, like having experience in youth ministry and kids ministry, I've never found it effective to do their model where you undo all of the, uh, the, the evolutionary beliefs and then present the gospel through that. I've never found that effective. I've never seen it work. And I'm sure that there are testimonials that you'll hear here and there, but overall, like that's not what people want. That's not what connects with people. What connects with people is relationship. And that's, you know, this, this curriculum is not relationship focused. This curriculum is very knowledge. You can see my dog in the background, by the way. He likes to peek his head out the window. What a pretty dog. Oh, thank you. Um, but this, this curriculum takes a very dogmatic, uh, information based approach. And it does take that stereotypical answers in Genesis approach where you have to believe it or else everything falls apart. It doesn't allow any room for discussion. It's just, it cuts it off at the pass and says, and, and it actually at near the end of the chapter, I don't think I sent this page to you, but at the end of the chapter, it mocks people a little bit who believe in old earth creationism. And I'm just thinking, you're talking about kids' parents here. You're talking about their teachers that they trust. Are you really going to try to undo all of that right now? When we've still got, we've got a week to focus in on the gospel and to try to share the, with these kids a message that they're going to remember at least for a couple of weeks, but hopefully for the rest of their lives. Do you really want to sow all of these seeds of doubt in just the one week that you have with them? That's very fascinating. Hmm. That's interesting. And of course, you're going to have, I mean, from a church perspective, like, I guess the answers in Genesis, that's it. The whole Genesis topic is such a huge deal. But like, I mean, if I'm sending my child to some random church that, you know, some friend invited me and, you know, maybe I believe in evolution or something like that. And I'm sending my child there and then they're like teaching them, oh, evolution is bad. Like, it doesn't seem like a church I might want to go back to. Um, I mean, I mean, not like for me particularly, I don't think it's worth that crazy enough, but like other people I'm sure would have that feeling. Yeah. And I wouldn't blame them. Honest. I mean, I'm a young earth creationist saying, I don't blame you if you think young earth creationists are kind of freaky. Some of them act really crazy. I mean, and it's an uphill battle if you don't have the parents involved. And that's part of the problem I have with the curriculum is, is this thing functions without the parents. It, it doesn't take into account what they may be learning at home, but there's a, there's a way that we focus on it um, at Centricid camps. 
uh, no matter how much good that we can do when we're working with these kids, you're never going to be as good as that kid's church leaders. And so we always try to connect them back with their church leaders when we have a good conversation with them. Same thing goes with churches. As much good as you can do with these churches, with these kids that you see uh, week after week, you're never going to be as effective as their parents. And if the parents are not in on board and involved with this young earth creation approach, you're never going to get anywhere with them. We can go ahead and talk about the science, I guess, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this is like a little bit fun for me because uh, I really hadn't done much research on the topic. I mean, I've seen some videos, um, you know, for both sides. I, I grew up, my family, young earth creationist uh, very much, um, you know, and since then I've kind of barely looked into the subject a little bit. Um, but I, I would say I understand the evolutionist view, but I'm I'm not going to actively promote it on my channel um, yeah. for the most part. But um, yeah, so this is very interesting. Um, this is just what I'll do. I'll give you my my first thoughts about like what they're trying to convey, and I want to get your thoughts about whether you agree or disagree with that or not, and like if you see any issues. Um, I know that like just with my past experience so i went to liberty university um i i did their um their little creation young earth creationist class as a core and that was that was way back and that was really interesting but i'm seeing a lot of the same stuff here so i'm it's almost like it's it's almost like i don't know if like if it's just not really updated or what it's weird but anyways um so it gets into saying uh, share several or all of the following examples of fossil finds and how they are really fakes or mistakes. Decide which key pieces of information you want to share about each one, but don't feel compelled to share everything written here. Um, so it gets into Lucy. It gets into Ramapathicus, uh, Neanderthal. It talks about Pildown Man, Nebraska Man, and Aboriginal people, mm -hmm. um, which that, that was an interesting one. So first of all, you know, as you mentioned, um, Pilled Down Man, Nebraska Man, I looked into it. Yeah, I mean, they're fake. Um, I I have no issue saying that. Um, it's weird, though, for me, like, why they would want to present that. Because, like, so, say if I'm a child, you know, four or five years old, and, um, you know, my church leaders say, hey, evolution is bad, um, and they what they do is they only give you like two or three reasons to believe in evolution when there's like a whole bunch of reasons that most scientists would say, now you can disagree with those reasons, but if you don't present the evidence, like a child, you know, when they graduate, they go into college, they're like, Oh wait, you didn't tell me all about this other evidence. And you know, you get the idea of like being lied to and um, resentment and that has nothing to do with whether it's true or not, but that's just a psychological thing that happens. I mean, it talks, I've I've hear I hear people all the time like, oh, I used to be a Calvinist and now I'm an Armenian or vice versa. And, and they're like, oh, they didn't tell me that. I, I was lied to this whole time. And it's like, well, I mean, I I disagree with you. They should have told you that, but I still disagree with you because you know there's this different reasons. But sometimes it's just like a psychological thing and it can be that could be very dangerous for children specifically because you know they're at a at a point where they're they're, they don't have the knowledge or ability to understand these concepts very well. Um, so, so as I mentioned before, they talk about Lucy, Ramapithecus, and Neanderthal. So Neanderthal, from my basic understanding of it, is that it's not really used as evidence much from what I hear from, from evolutionists. Um, and then the Nebraska man and Pildown man, well, yeah, they're not going to because most people agree that they're fakes. Um, Rambopithecus, I honestly didn't even study that much. Lucy was very interesting to me because, so I just looked at some popular uh, YouTuber evolutionists just to see like what they said, like and compared to this. And basically it says, Lucy, what was found? Some bones, um, which is weird. Like some bones, like almost like it's saying, oh, it's just bones, like, uh, like, like, sure, it's not just some bones. Like, I don't know. It's weird. Like, it doesn't give you any significance of why they think the evolutionists think that's important. Um, and then it says, 
what was said about it, Lucy could walk upright, had a hairy body, and had human hands and feet. And the real story, all the bones found at Lucy were obviously bones from an ape. However, the scientists who found Lucy falsely said her knee bone showed she walked standing up like men. When the bones were measured, they showed she didn't walk upright, but walked more like a chimp or an orangutan, an ape. A scientist also said her hip bone showed she walked upright, but he actually had to grind away parts of the bone and glue them together to make it look like she walked upright. So it seems like they're saying uh, they're taking what was said or they, you know, enters in Genesis proposed or thinks they said. I don't know exactly because it, because they don't want to like make it too complex for a child, right. but they also, they also don't want to, um, they, but it doesn't seem like they're exactly presenting everything. I mean, I'm going to put like 17 different things on the screen as far as just like what they propose. Most evolutionists, well, a lot of evolutionists propose is like why they reason. And it's like um, at least five or six things about like why Lucy was such a big deal as far as like it seems like, you know, the the one part of the brain is the same size or the the cavity or whatever. And something like Lucy had a large thumb. The only visible difference in our hands versus those of living apes is that their thumbs are smaller. But as you can see in this reconstruction, Lucy had a larger thumb, more like our hands than any other living ape. Feet was mostly human. Newer discoveries give a different indication, saying that Lucy's feet were mostly human and that she couldn't climb trees much better than we could. Walk easier because he had a different knee, Achilles tendon, three arches in our feet, just like humans. But the fossil suggests a foot skeleton that trends in the human direction, but which also preserves a number of arboreal features. Lucy's thigh muscles were in an intermediate position between humans and other apes like chimpanzees and gorillas, and she could walk better than them because she also had a bulbous knee and an Achilles tendon and three arches in her feet, just like we do. Um, so apparently those were a big deal, which they don't really mention here. So that's weird. Um, you were going to say something? I was just... I mean, it's like the Santa Claus effect. You tell a kid about Santa Claus, and you play it up, and you give evidences for it, and then eventually they go off somewhere else or they hear from somebody else, hey, Santa's not real. And then all of a sudden, wow, you got a big old handful of resentment on your hands. And and, and that's that that's a lot of my issue with it is like you're you're creating this tension in a time when they need stability. And it, like I I mean I agree. I would like to see uh more kids and more families hold a young earth creationist perspective, but there's a way you go about it in a way that doesn't create that tension. And also, the way that they uh, that they frame these things here makes it look so antagonistic. It's almost like a grudge match, honestly. The way it's written is almost like uh, the Answers in Genesis people have a grudge match with the people uh, who made these original discoveries, and it's like this is their this is their firestorm tweet that's supposed to shoot down the uh, the arguments of the other side. It's just it's it's not a healthy environment for kids. Yeah. And something I found really interesting was that it seems like their approach is to like go on the offensive and say, okay, this is what they believe. This is the reasons they believe it. And we're going to shut all of them down. But then I, you know, I, I look into it a little bit more and, you know, previous knowledge. And it's like, there's a, if you ask an evolutionist, most of them will give you like 20 different reasons why they're evolutionists. It's not just like one, like, having to do with humans and i guess maybe because it was kind of like focused on the image of god that's somewhat related but but even then like it's not like they're gonna convert a an evolutionist child just in like that short time period anyways yep. with that little bit of david data so i'm not even sure i really don't understand what they're trying to get at um maybe that's my lack of knowledge and maybe i shouldn't be talking about that because of it it's just weird to me well, now that you mention that, can you imagine what would happen if one of these churches was running a VBS and then an evolutionary biologist's kid came in who actually knows stuff and then starts <laughs> questioning? Can you imagine the conversation that would happen in that room? Well, I mean, I I highly doubt that most of the people, I guess, leading this are familiar with that with the topic very much, I would assume. Yeah. It's one of those so, topics people get really impassioned about, but then when you start yeah. asking them questions, it turns out they don't really know very much. Yeah, that's that. There's something to that too. Yeah, you you probably know better than I do. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> no, you, that's funny. Um, one more thing I wanted to mention. So it says a scientist also said her hip bone showed she walked upright, but he actually had to grind away parts of the bone and glue them together to make it look like she walked upright. 
So assuming that that's true, which I looked into it, and you, well, you have to show evidence for that, that the, the scientist that was grinding away was actually trying to, you know, make a fake or something like that. Um, but assuming that it is true, um, assuming that they didn't have a legitimate, legit, like scientific reason to do that, that they do other every other time um, when in any other scientific topic about bones, um, assuming that is true, um, like, what would that even mean? Like that all that means is they falsified just one part of the entire skeleton. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, ways they promote the, the reasons that they think Lucy is such a good evidence for, you know, evolution and all that. Uh, which I just, I don't know. It's just the whole thing just seems really weird to me. Um, and then one more thing mentioned is the idea of a missing link. So yeah, sure. There's, that is definitely something that's very popular, but it kind of gives the false idea as far as like evolutionists don't think it's like one straight line from humans to, to apes or something like that. It's, it's like, it branches out. It's kind of like a tree. And this is another idea of like, if you don't teach the idea correctly, they're going to resent you for it. And I, you know, I don't even care if you teach young earth creation, but if you, if you do it, you have to do it correctly. Otherwise it, there's negative consequences to that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, definitely agreed on that. And it's, it, it's, it's frustrating because it's like they're presenting it in such a simplistic, overly simplistic manner. And then someone can come in and say, well, why is it you're, teaching this really complex topic, but it's okay. We're teaching in a really simplified way, but the really simplified way that you're teaching it makes it seem a little bit dishonest. It's probably because it's better to save this for a time when it's better to teach this to kids, maybe over an extended period of time with parental involvement. It's just, it's all in the wrong setting and done the wrong way. And the majority of the time when it comes to young earth creationists, aside from the insane ones that we stay very, very far away from, my issue is usually with approach. Same with most Southern Baptist churches or Methodist churches or pretty much any church. Usually my my issue is not as much with the knowledge as it is with the approach. When you're trying to win someone over to something, when you're trying to convince someone, the way that you approach the conversation is just as important as having the truth. And the approach here is just garbage. That's fascinating. I agree with that, though. Um, is there any other things you want to mention that were just like weird or um, just not something that you'd, you'd prefer to do? I know you mentioned something about the gospel. Yeah. So in, in the uh, day four of the curriculum, and I think I sent it to you, this is the way that they present it is they do like a seven step process of presenting the gospel. Um, and there's nothing there's nothing theologically wrong with it. It's just very clunky. It's like. It's like you're when when you're moving and you're trying to carry like boxes up over your head to to where you have to walk backwards in order to get it through the door, and you got to bend your knees in order to make sure that the top box isn't knocked off. It's carrying too much for a very simplistic conversation. I mean, because like you can present the gospel in less than three minutes. All of this that they've crammed into this gospel presentation that they haven't mentioned previously. I think I think I said earlier that when I uh, when I rewrote it, every day had a piece of the gospel or the entire gospel presentation. I think I introduced the gospel on the first day. I did a uh, while we weren't focused on the gospel presentation. I did share what the gospel was on day two. Day three was our actual gospel presentation day. And then day four, we did the reminder of the gospel presentation. And now you can take this and you can share it with somebody else. And here's some handouts so that you can talk to other people about it. We had this constant reminder that we would do to help build it up in kids' heads. They didn't have that in this curriculum. So you had three days of just... Uh, of undoing this evolutionary approach. And then all of a sudden you have this really complex approach to presenting the gospel. It's, it's a lot for the kids to keep up with. It's a lot of information. I mean, you had, you had uh, picture one creation. You talk about creation because that's what AIG loves to do. Present the gospel through the entire creationist story. Uh, then you've got the fall of man after that. Okay. So we, we were created. Now we have a problem. Jesus has a baby and then Jesus has a man, Jesus carrying the cross, Jesus risen and the gift. 
that's a lot of information that you could sum up in maybe three pieces. You could just simply say, we can all think of times that we've done something wrong. We can all t think of times that we've done something that we shouldn't have done. Okay, that's sin, and that takes us away from God. But God makes a way for us to be with him, and that's through Jesus. Jesus came to the earth. He died on the cross so that we could have a way to be with God again. And all he's asking for us is to believe him, to ask him to be our savior, and to turn away from our sins. You can do an easy gospel presentation just like that, it, but it, it's just very clunky. It's not bad. It's just, it's cumbersome and a lot of information for what should be a really simple and straightforward conversation. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, but I wanted to say that at least just because. Uh... Oh, um, did you have any thoughts about the image of God part? Um, I honestly don't remember it. Uh, that um, was in the first day, right? Yeah. Yeah, the very page 15. They um so I was waiting for them to give an image like a uh, actual the uh definition of what they thought the image of God was and I don't think I ever saw it. <laughs> Come to think of it, you're right. <laughs> that was that was weird because I was I was I mean, I would say like scholarship has pretty much decided that it's not some like you know thing that were uh like we gain like uh being smart or uh you know whatever or like a soul mm -hmm. or something like that um i mean i don't know what you're using it but that's just uh okay. that's uh i was i was ready to i was very interested to see what they were gonna say and then they didn't yeah <laughs> i i did fill in that gap looking back at that i yeah because it's it's oh, not did. here but i did i did give them a, a simplistic definition of god's image what would you say it was, where it is? I explained it as um, being made in God's image as being like God's reflection. So, for example, like God makes us different from the animals. And uh, one of the things that I really liked from day two, which I actually stole and used in day one, uh, was to introduce this idea about how God made us different and how he makes us special and separate from the rest of creation. Like I said, it's one of those messages that... Uh, that you get no matter which thing you believe in. Mm. Um, and so what I focused on is like how uh, there's so many things that these animals can do, like kangaroos can, you know, they can do this thing where they pop back on their tail and they kick their legs up and it's really cool. Can't really type on a computer and they can't really, you know, sing karaoke. And, was, and we went through all of these different animals to explain like all the cool things that they could do. And then we even, and this fun thing where we like pretend got on a plane, flew our whole way over to Africa for a quick moment. And we looked at monkeys and we saw how, oh, well, they've got so many similarities to people. Surely there's everything that they, there's so many things that they can do. And there were still things that they could list that monkeys couldn't do that we could do. So they can get back in the plane, fly back to Australia. Um, and it's my idea that I gave to them was when we're made in his image, we're a reflection of God. We're not God. And I had a mirror at this point. It's like, you see yourself in the mirror. All right. That's you in the mirror, right? Give me a high five. Pow! And I just like slap the mirror really hard. And like, they, you know, they get the pictures like that's not you in the mirror, but it looks like you. It's just your reflection. We're made so that when other people or when uh, the animals in the world look at us, they can see a part of who God is. They can see like we're given dominion over the world. Okay. God has dominion over all of creation. Okay. That's a reflection. It's not God, but it looks like God. So I gave them the idea of the reflection to give them a basic ground understanding of we're the only things that are made to reflect God's image this way. That's very fascinating. There's definitely some similarities to um, what I would say is like more popular reason scholarship. So um, what I would characterize is like we image God, we are his representative. So in the ancient Near East, you know, the, the surrounding nations, like um, whether it be a king or an idol, um, which is, you know, that's what the word image in Hebrew is, selim. Um, but and I mean, I don't know. I'm just for just for the audience. I don't know how much you know about this, but um, basically like there and they have this, the there's like a statue of a king and on it it'll it'll say uh 
image and likeness of God or something like that. Image of God, image of yeah. likeness, same words used. And, um, and you're like, what does that mean? No, it's not obviously not the, the actual king. It's right. that, that king, it, it, what it does is it represents it in the land. And what exactly that means is a different story. But well, then what we see in Genesis is, you know, God doesn't place the uh, one specific king and definitely not a, like an idol. It's, it is man and woman. They're the image of God. And you know, that's obviously going to be completely different in the eyes of an ancient Israelite. Um, but then, of course, when you get to the temple where an idol normally is, there's no idol in there. And it's because, or you can infer that it's because we are the idol or the image of God. Um, but just a different perspective uh, yeah. for those that haven't already heard. Um, uh so yeah, that, that was very interesting to me. I I was I was interested by that. Um, anyways, um, so uh, before we get started, um, I just want to get your thoughts as far as like what are the pros? I know that my pro that I liked um, a lot about this was you know answers in Genesis. They obviously they think that the 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 young earth creationism the the what happens in the Garden of Eden is an extremely important thing, mm-hmm. and you know they talk about it and they they make it a big deal. And I mean, that's obviously as Christians, you know, if we find something that's important that we should definitely be willing to talk about it. Um, and of course, there's depending on the age audience, um, some of this is probably going to be really applicable, helpful. Um, they don't go too complicated in some subjects. And it was almost entertaining to even read it just to, like to picture myself being there of the interesting things that they'd be doing to keep the children's attention and all that. But uh, what, what would you say of pros on your side? So one of the pros that I would say is. Um, And this is just from a technical point. There's more than enough material here to fill the time. Um, And that's even though I trashed almost all of it. um, I I will say that one of the things that I've found uh, as I've been developing stuff for our youth group and uh, as I was redeveloping stuff for our VBS this year, you've got to have enough stuff to fill the time. I always had an extra game prepared or an extra discussion thing prepared in case uh, we had an extra five minutes and I needed to fill that little bit of a gap. There's more than enough here to fill what we needed. As a matter of fact, if we used this material the way it's written, we probably, we had, what, 25 minutes? We probably would have only been able to get to a fourth of every day. Um, so you're not going to run short of material. Another thing that I think is uh, a big pro is they show this desire for understanding the word of God. Now, I think that they go about it in the wrong way sometimes, but um, I'm comforted to know that there's still this love and desire for uh, knowing the word of God and presenting it accurately. That's one of the things I've always liked about Answers in Genesis, even when I can't stand them, is I I can at least know that they're going to try to show honor to the word of God. And there's a few activities here and there I used, um, but overall, overall, I'm probably only use like two or three of them, but I'd say those are my two big things that I liked from this material. I'm sure you could have used the puppet one. Maybe if I punched the puppet a few times, I think they would get a <laughs> kick out of that. I'm sure they would. Uh, David Falk, uh, he's an Egyptologist YouTuber. He, uh, he's, he pulling out, he's pulling out a little puppet on his streams sometimes, which is the weirdest thing. I mean, it's entertaining for sure. It's just not what you expect. I may have to look this up later. <laughs> oh man. It's funny. Um, people make memes out of it and all it's funny. Um, but anyway, yep. So anyways, that's all I, uh, I had all my thoughts on it. All my questions. Actually, no, take it back. I've got other questions. Take it back. Okay. Um, Okay. Yep. So can you talk about some general ideas of how we can be, uh, you know, church leaders, uh, share our convictions, share what we believe, but do it without, you know, completely closing off discussion. Um, You know, kind of like you talked about where your church is like open to even, you know, going against the norm. So this is, I'm going to harken back again to my center kid days. there, there's a saying that we lived by every single day. Ministry happens the best in the context of relationships. Uh, the the idea is that if the kids trust you and if they feel like uh, they can talk to you and they can share things with you in confidence, then they're more willing to listen. 
And I've not only found that true in my everyday life, but there's even surveys that support it. I've I've looked up at least four different uh, surveys on how Gen Z and millennials interact with the church. And overwhelmingly, I think there was one that was uh, asking Gen Z, what are the reasons or what things do you find effective in somebody who presents the gospel and what things are not effective? The top five things for Gen Z were all relationship focused. The top one was someone who's able to listen without judging. Okay, that's a difficult one for us to do because I know we've all got strong opinions about things. But the number one thing that young people find most engaging is someone who's able to listen to them without judging them. If you can prove that you're a safe person to be around, they're much more willing to listen to you. Another thing that I would say, just kind of like a side thing, is don't be overly dogmatic. Understand what the basic principles are that you need to hold to and uh, and use those as your point of union. I mean, you look at uh, the letters that Paul wrote to the churches. Corinth was messed up. Corinth was like really, really messed up. And yet still he would address them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we need to remember that even with these vast disagreements, if they've taken Jesus to be their savior, if they've turned from their sins and they are trying their best to follow Jesus and they've given their lives to him, that's our brother or our sister in Christ. And we need to make sure that we're acting that way. And I brought up, I brought this up earlier. I can't remember if I brought it up uh, while we were recording, but this is my favorite book when it comes to having the old earth, young earth discussions. It's called The Fool and the Heretic by uh, Dr. Todd Wood and Dr. Daryl Falk. And what I love about it is it models exactly what we need to do when we have these kinds of discussions uh, in churches. Instead of doing this like big fight where we're where we're dogging on people who disagree with us, um, we have this back and forth discussion. The way it works is Todd Wood would write one chapter and send his transcript over to Dr. Falk, and then Dr. Falk would read it over, and he'd write a one chapter response and then send that to Dr. Wood, and they do this cordial back and forth. And on the bookends at the beginning and the end of the book, they say, we are brothers in Christ. This is not going to tear us apart. And they do these, they do these live fool and heretic talks uh, fr pretty frequently where they actually model this for the audience and they have these back and forth discussions and then they leave and they go celebrate a holiday together. I mean, that's what it should look like within the church. This idea of listening and understanding first, earning the trust, so that then you can share your opinions with confidence. Also, learning how to be age appropriate helps. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, just random question: Who's the fool? Who's the heretic? I guess the heretic is the evolutionist, right? Yes, Doctor Doctor Falk would be the heretic, and Doctor Wood would be the fool. Uh, they 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 took their their own. Uh, the generalizations that are given for each of their positions. Oh, if you're an evolutionist and you're a heretic. Oh, if you're a young earth creationist and you're a fool and you don't believe the sciences. Blah, blah, blah. So they just, they played off as like, okay, we'll embrace it. Well, my first thought was fool is typically associated with, uh, you know, proverbs and the, like the atheist fool and his folly, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's funny. Um, but anyways, you know, it's been fun having you on here, Steve. Um, you have your your podcast and YouTube channel. You want to yes. go ahead and connect those so people can get more from you? Yes. So um, I have my own personal one, one out of one, which is how um, he found me. But um, that's not where I put most of my work and most of my effort. That's just kind of a place where I dump things. The place where I do most of my work is on the Mongoose Productions YouTube channel. It's a little M and a P attached together. We're doing a podcast right now, which you can also find on most podcast platforms called Men Who Talk Through Movies. We're just guys who get on a stream, turn on a movie in the background, and then just talk about literally anything. But it also models what we think is important is showing how Christians can be involved in the world and can engage with something in the world without shoving it to the outside. We can watch these popular movies and use those as an interesting discussion point in order to talk about our faith or other things that we believe. That's awesome. That's awesome. Really cool. Man. And uh, I'll, we'll definitely have to talk about ne next thing we can talk about some other time. Yeah. But uh 
It's been fun having you on. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people got out of this. This has been very, very interesting to me. Uh, but yeah, Stephen, I hope you have a great rest of your day for me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're a good host. Aw.